I was at the Indian Embassy in Washington at that time, okay. and it was his centenary year. And it's also a coincidence that uh, the Prime Minister of India at that time, I.K. Gujral, was a Punjabi and a yes. great fan of my grandfather's oh. books. So he decided to celebrate the centenary uh, in a big way. I started getting invites from LA, from Chicago, from New Jersey, from Miami, from events being organized by the Punjabi diaspora to celebrate my grandfather's centenary. Wow. For me, religion is personal, humanity is universal. True. And he quotes Guru Gobind Singh, Manas ki jat sab ek pehchan ho. We are all from one creed of humanity. He quotes Guru Granth Sahib and uh, particularly Kabir uh, in Guru Granth Sahib. Abal Allah Nooru Payo Kudrat Ke Sab Bande Ek Noor Se Sab Jag Upjaya Kaun Pade Kaun Mande One of his seminal books was Khuni Vaisakhi hmm. which is the long poem he wrote after surviving the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. Right. And he, in this book he goes takes us back to 1919 hmm. and he said in 1919 in Jallianwala Bagh Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs were fighting together shoulder to shoulder against the British rule. Their blood mingled to make the soil of Jalayawala Bagh crimson and hello. Karam tum parthi, te taram tum manav puji hai. Nanak Singh is a Punjabi by birth, an Indian by choice, but his religion, his creed is humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm Abhir Lairi. You're watching ABB Live Podcast. You're also listening to ABB Live Podcast. I'm Abhir Lairi. Joining me today in conversation is Mr. Navdeep Suri, also Ambassador Navdeep Suri. He has been the ambassador to many countries. Uh, Australia, uh, High Commissioner uh, High Commissioner to Australia. Ambassador Ambas to Egypt and UAE. Ambassador uh, to Egypt and UAE. Of course, I, I know the credentials. I was just fumbling because... It, <laughs> Uh, there are a few people you see them on TV screens and then they are sitting next to you and it feels great to have these kind of conversation. He uh, came up with the sequel of Hymns of Blood, A Game of Fire by Nanak Singh, his grandfather. Today we'll have uh, uh, dig deep into his world of literature, into his legacy. Welcome to the podcast. How are you? Delighted to be here. With you. Uh, you are one of those people who has uh, closely associated with their grandparents a lot of lot of Indians are actually, we are very culturally inclined towards our grandparents, Nana, Nani, Dada, Dadi. I am also one of them. Let's start with that, that anecdote. How was the relationship with your Dadu, your grandfather? It's amazing, but it is too short. Uh, he passed away when I was 12 and my childhood memories are um, either him coming over, he and my grandmother coming over to our home in Amritsar. Um, or us going over sometimes on weekends and then for extended uh, break during the summer uh, to their place which was in the village called Preetnagar about 20 miles from so not a very long distance yep. um, but um, but those days I guess 20 kilometers was but uh, you know my, my fondest memories really are of uh, the extended family getting together in Preetnagar during the summer vacations and uh, you know we'd mess around all day and in the evening we'd all get after my grandfather and saying Bauji, Bauji, tell us a story, tell us a story and we used to have these charpais in the village wow. and, and so he'd put out one and another one and then there would be eight, nine, ten of us uh, youngsters um, maybe aged between five and ten or twelve or whatever um, sit around him and he'd make up stories and uh, enact them and sometimes he would laugh out loud, sometimes he'd be yelling as he enacted the characters um, and uh, little idea that we had that we were in the shadow of Punjabi's greatest storyteller. Right. Uh, so, you know, uh, or 1971 war. So we went to Preetnagar uh, to bring him to Amritsar because uh, Preetnagar is just four kilometers from the border and the army had already uh, encamped itself in our village. And so um, we had him sort of captive with us for two weeks during the war. And while there were air raid sirens and there, were, there was a war going on, <coughs> so my friends from our neighborhood would come and again we'd sit with him and he'd, have, he'd be telling us stories. 
And those are probably the last ones that we heard because, if I remember correctly, the war was from the 3rd to the 17th of December. Mm. And on the 28th of December, 71, he yeah, left us uh, due to a cardiac failure. So, uh, yeah. Wow. A lot of legacy behind. A lot of his literature is cherished by numerous people. They, they're, like it's a it's a pure gold for a lot of Punjabis who read Gurumukhi who read Punjabi. For me, I I may not have been exposed to that literature, but thanks to this book and a lot of other books, uh, you have translated your grand uh, grandfather's work. What is Game of Fire all about? For all those people who may not know about this book or may not have read it. So yeah, let me just rewind. Uh, I think you know we spoke about my grandfather when I was growing up, but then. School, college, university, job. True. Literally, we got so busy with our own lives that we forgot about our legacy. Mm. And if I fast forward to 1997, okay. I was at the Indian Embassy in Washington at that time, okay. and it was his centenary year. And it's also a coincidence that uh, the Prime Minister of India at that time, I.K. Gujral, was a Punjabi and a yes. great fan of my grandfather's oh. books. So he decided to celebrate the centenary uh, in a big way, released a postage stamp, a first day cover. There was a special event at Prime Minister's residence uh, where my parents went and all of that. And there was a buzz about it. Okay. Suddenly, I somebody broke a story that Nanak Singh's grandson happens to be at the embassy in Washington. Oh, they had no clue about that? And, and I started getting invites from LA, from Chicago, from New Jersey, from Miami, from events being organized by the Punjabi diaspora to celebrate my grandfather's century. Wow. And I'd go for these events uh, in a private capacity, doff, put aside my diplomatic hat. And I'd meet these, particularly what was deeply touching was these elderly women, usually in their 50s, 60s, 70s. I was a young diplomat then. And they'd hold my hand. You are Nanak Singh's grandson. Bete, you have no idea. We learned Punjabi so that we could read his novels. Wow. Or we learned Punjabi by reading his novels. Uh, and, and somewhere the penny trap. Man, this is the legacy. So, you know, we were joking the other day that some people are bequeathed properties and wealth. Yeah. We inherited a lot of books. True, 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 true. Um, so these two novels, you know, coming to your question. Um, these are two of his seminal works on the partition. Now, let me take you to 1947. Nanak Singh at that time is a formidable public intellectual in Amritsar. He's already got a dozen bestsellers to his credit. And he is observing the violence around him. He's trying to quell it. He's trying to do what he can. And he is completely traumatized by what he's seeing around himself. He goes into deep depression. Um, under my grandfather's, grandmother's advice, he turns back to the scriptures, finds some solace. And then these two books are like a catharsis for him. He just pours out everything. But because he's a novelist, he's such a great storyteller, um, he says in the foreword, that the characters might be fictitious, but the events are 100% true. Either he saw them firsthand, or he heard the stories from people who had actually experienced these. So the first book, Hymns in Blood, is set in 1947, entirely in a small village called Chakri, about 30, 35 kilometers from where what is present-day Rawalpindi. Okay. Uh, and this was the Potohar area, the highlands near uh, Rawalpindi, uh, from where you had a mass exodus of the Hindu and Sikh community. Right. It's a beautifully textured account of what life in a village is pre-1947. Sure. Um, communities have lived together for generations. The bonds are deep. Uh, you have a Muslim majority village. But the Pradhan of the village, uh, the head of the village is a Hindu who happens to be a very erudite scholarly person. Um, they celebrate Lori, Holi, Eid, Diwali together. Wow. 
and, and that's the culture of that place that we the book acquaints us with. And then you have the uh, winds of communal violence sweeping that region. You know, the Muslim League's demand for Pakistan and what it uh, then sets off. And people in this village can see that inferno coming towards them. It's torching city after city. city. And yet they believe naively that our village, we are so close to each other, nothing's ever going to happen to us. And, and, and the Muslim elders of the village are telling the Hindus and Sikhs, we will give our lives up before we allow any and, and yet the inevitable is coming. And then you see this Hindu elder and his young Muslim foster daughter, uh, along with their extended family, trying to escape under an escort provided by the Muslim young men of the village to, to make sure that they reach safety. Many of them don't. But this book is really then that old man, Hindu, and the young foster daughter, uh, a Muslim, being the only two survivors who make it across. Which brings us to the second book. book. The first safe haven is Amritsar. Okay. Where all the refugees come. Uh, come. Uh, and there are refugee camps springing up and the Golden Temple has been taken over by refugees and the Sarai, Guru Ramdas Sarai, which is the big inn right next to the Golden Temple is right. overtaken by refugees. This book is set entirely in Amritsar in that same period of the first eight months of 1947. And I really think it's one of the most granular accounts uh, in this vast body of partition literature that has emerged mm -hmm. of an eyewitness sitting in Amritsar observing and then describing the events uh, that he saw. For me, this was really, a, 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 you know, translating these two books was a journey for me. Um, at one level, discovering my grandfather. Mm -hmm. Now as an adult. Agreed. Uh, not the childhood memories uh, uh, of innocence. Yeah. But discovering his deep intellectual honesty, his courage, his willingness to call a spade a spade, regardless of consequences. And so this book, uh, A Game of Fire, really helps me complete the partition story that I heard from so many relatives and friends and their families. The partition story we heard growing up and later was obviously from the refugees who came from the other side. Agreed. Many in Delhi, uh, we have relatives here, uh, all, all, all across Bar. and in Punjab itself. And there was a story of their trauma, of the rape and violence and pillage and murder and all of that, that the families genuinely experienced True. in that exodus. What this made me sit up and realize was perhaps we were no laggards when it came to violence as well. Um, <coughs> and to hear my grandfather describe incidents where a Sikh mob is targeting innocent Muslims or a Sikh mob is stripping and parading a Hindu girl naked and bringing her to a golden temple. I thought, man, in those polarized times when tempers are so high, it takes guts to write that. True. It's gut-wrenching, but you really need some steel inside you to be able to say, my community was also, 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 also guilty. Um, and, 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 and that was my sort of other journey of discovery into the city in which I was born, Amritsar. I spent my first 22 years in, in, in Amritsar and uh, when I was researching for this book, it just came, you know, some statistics can shock you. And so the last census before independence was in 1941. 1941, right. Amritsar had a 46% Muslim population. Really? I grew up in the 60s and 70s and 80s, early 80s in a city where there were none. Virtually. 
I mean, the only Muslims that I remember seeing are were were Kashmiris bringing shawls or Afghans bringing dry fruits, uh, you know. But the indigenous Punjabi Muslim population was none. Was none. The old historic mosques were all shattered. Um, and so, you know, there was that other side of the partition story, which we haven't heard. And my, my grandpa had the courage to tell us that story as well, uh, not hiding from us uh, what he saw. And one final thought about this particular theme is, I think this discovering who he was is his robust, almost cast iron commitment to secularism, uh, where he says, I'm a devout Sikh, but that's my personal matter. For me, religion is personal, humanity is universal. True. And he quotes Guru Gobind Singh, Manas ki jat sab ke pehchan bo. We are all from one creed of humanity. He quotes Guru Granth Sahib and uh, particularly Kabir uh, in Guru Granth Sahib. Abwal Allah noor upayo kudrat ke sab bande. Ek noor se sab jag upjaya. Korn pade, korn mande. Wow. We're all from the same light. True. And what right do we have to say? One's superior, one's inferior. So his, and, 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 and there's a beautiful line that we put. In, so we, in, in, in Amritsar and Gunagya University, uh, we set up a little Nanaxing center. There's a line that we put in his own handwriting where he says, who am I? So he says, Nanak Singh, I'll, I'll say this in Punjabi and then maybe yeah, translate please. it. So he says, Nanak Singh, Janam to Punjabi, Karam to Parthi, Te Taram to Manav Puji. Nanak Singh is a Punjabi by birth, an Indian by choice, but his religion, his creed is humanity. humanity. So cool. That's who he was. That's what I discovered from these two books. So good. I have a couple of questions uh, since we were talking. Sorry for giving you such a long, no, 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 no. long-winded uh, 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 reply. The, I had a lot of questions during this time when you were saying. Firstly, uh, not just as a grandson, but you are also the translator of this book. Since you have not witnessed that that time, this is more. Uh, this is a question to the translator inside you. Uh, how do you draw the balance? How do you draw the emotions? with which a writer has written the original script and now you are translating and you still have to consider all the emotions in place. 1947, we have experienced it. emotions we writing is so powerful that it can translate. Ho sakti hai. But how do we make it relevant for all those people, to, uh, for all the readers out there, out there to actually um, absorb all the emotions with which the writer has written the book? And you know, that's a challenge for the translator, right? Yeah. Um, you are not simply translating from one language. It's not like a Google Translate. You one, just one language to another. another. You are also trying to bridge a distance in time and space. Right, right. Uh, happened 75 years ago. Yeah. So the vocabulary, the syntax is different. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, today, if you are translating Shakespeare or something from that period, yeah. You will obviously be mindful of the syntax that is used. Right. The geography can be different. Yes. I want this book to be accessible to say somebody reading it in Toronto and Birmingham as much as it is to somebody reading it in Punjab or Right, Delhi. right. And, and and so you're mindful of those uh, gaps that you need to bridge. Mm -hmm. And so what you try to move yourself away from is um, I think when I was when I first started translating, I was a fairly hesitant okay. translator. When I did his famous novel Pavitra Papi, mm -hmm. which was published as The Watchmaker, I think I was mindful that there's this extended family of cousins and everybody will be poring over every line and saying, Tumne aise kiya, okay. aise nahi kiya, or second guessing you. Right. I think with time, um, I'm more confident. And I now take chunks rather than line by line. Okay. And that gives me the flexibility to put in the emotion that I need to capture. Mm -hmm. um, it, need, it gives me the uh, liberty to stay true to the original, but still capture it 
as faithfully as possible in the new language. Okay. Sometimes it means being inventive. Okay. Sometimes it means using devices, yep. um, which are hard, <coughs> hard to translate. Take like this is a book set in Amritsar, old city, mm -hmm. small house, and in those houses, you had something called the mug. I don't know if you're familiar. I, I don't know. What is mug? Uh, like a attic? No, like an a, attic? A, a mug was like. I mean, its closest equivalent would be a skylight. Okay, but uh, it was really a a gap in the ceiling or in the roof mm -hmm. in which you had iron bars. Okay, I've seen it. Uh, and, 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 and you'd have light right. and air filter through. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now, is it a skylight? No, it's no, it's, it's not actually. It, because a skylight would visually give you a very different image. image. So I say, I, I say mug. But I throw hints from my side okay. that help you visualize. Sometimes I may be talking about the black iron rods that cross the sea. Sometimes I might be speaking about the raindrops filtering through uh, or the light, moonlight coming through. So that you get a visual idea. And I think, I guess the reason I'm saying this is today because <coughs> Sorry. Because in the art of translation, you take these liberties, you play around a little bit here and there where you need to. People are saying it's more of a transcreation than just translation. translation. Wow, what a nice word. Right? Uh, because you are recreating in a new and you are willingly inserting yourself into it. There's no getting away from that. I have a certain personality. I have a certain style. Mm. My grandfather had a certain That's personality and style. S what emerges is somewhere between the two. A br uh, basically a bridge <coughs> between, you know, I, 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 I may be consciously suppressing myself, but it will always manifest itself True. somewhere or the other right. uh, in my style. Mm. Uh, but I also want to try and stay true to his. Makes sense. And I think that's the beauty and the challenge of this whole True. business of translation. My second question uh, is uh, around his personality. Since you mentioned that he's he was a man of steel, he called spade a spade and it takes a lot of guts to call it. In the world of, sorry for a, uh, sorry for the lack of a better word, but in the world of pseudo-secularism, where everybody tries to be politically correct. Uh, let's address the elephant in the room. In the world of pseudo-secularism, it is very difficult for a lot and lot of people to pour their heart out. Do you think that we'll ever get an Anak Singh in, the, in this world or in future? Because it is getting very difficult day by day. Not talking about any political party or about any regime or about the entire environment. It is In general, the human species have, have evolved into a world where getting politically correct is more important than being true, yeah. to, true to that essence of the soul. And I, th I think he, 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 he says this in the beginning. He said, why am I writing this book in this foreword? Hmm. So he, he, he says in this foreword, why am I writing this book? This is historical fiction, but I'm no historian. Hmm. True. I'm writing this because I want to tell the events as I saw them. And I know that people 5, 10, 15 years from now, when they look back on this period, their perspective will be colored by whether the, the person is a narrator, is a Hindu or a Muslim yes. or a Sikh. Right. I want to put that away and say, this is what I saw. Islam, har, har ek and, uh, and, and he has the courage to point out three dangers. And, and I'll just rewind a little bit because, you know, one of his seminal books was Khuni Vesakhi, hmm. which is the long poem he wrote after su surviving the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. Right. Yep. And he, in this book, he goes, takes us back to 1919. Hmm. And he said, in 1919, in Jallianwala Bagh, Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs were fighting together, shoulder to shoulder against the British rule. Right. Their blood mingled to make the soil of Jalayawala Bagh crimson and hello. What happened to us today, 28 years uh, 
later. And he, and he draws that very strong uh, parallel. What he, he said on that day, we were fighting a common enemy. Today, we are fighting each other. On that day, many of us got angry and we uh, uh, trashed uh, the town hall and other symbols of imperial power in Amritsar. Today, we are torching each other's homes. And he says, this thing of brother turning on brother, neighbor turning on neighbor, and the kind of utter brutality, bestiality that Punjab saw in those difficult months, what explains it? And because he, he kind of modeled himself on Munshi Premchand and saw himself as a person who would reform society through his books, he gives us three warnings. He says, beware of religious leaders who will arouse your passions against others. Beware of political leaders who will use you by igniting your passions against others. Beware of the media, which will amplify and exaggerate and, and, and even create rumors that will turn you against each other. And I think the reason these books can be considered classics are that 75 years later, those messages are true, not just in India, Global. see what's happening in Palestine, see what's happening in America, see what's happening in other places. Uh, there's a timelessness about those yeah. warnings that he has that's given. That's why they are classics, I guess. And that's why I guess these, these, these books are classics. True. Makes sense. Let's, uh, let's read something. Let's read something. You were to, like before the, this podcast we were discussing and you mentioned that this is uh, on page 42. Uh, this is a very beautiful, uh, uh, how should I say, um, a story, an event, and basically a start of a story. This the hallmark, I think, of a great writer, and Nanak Singh was certainly a prolific and great writer, was is, 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 is her capacity or his capacity to observe things that we may not observe right. and then explain them. This particular description, there's a very interesting character in the book called Kanahiya. Hmm. He's a Pahari. Okay. Um, comes from the hills near Kangada. Okay. And is a manservant working in this Sikh household in Amritsar. Okay. So Kanahiya is being introduced to us through this uh, this description. story. Kanahiya had been working at Satnam's place for about 15 years. He came from a village in the hills of Kangara and was around 35 or 40 years old. Somewhat short in stature but quite brisk when it came to disposing of his chores. He had a bit of a squint in his left eye, which could be quite disconcerting when he looked at you. A large part of his head resembled a barren desert, with some unruly tufts of spiky hair guarding the periphery with the menacing profile of a cactus bush. His moustache had a similarly sparse appearance. But here's the strange thing. It wasn't the will of the Lord that deprived Kanhaya of his fair share of facial hair. The responsibility for this unfortunate outcome rested squarely on his own shoulders. You see, as he made the transition from youth into middle age, he became completely obsessed with any white hair on his visage. He'd look for the slightest opportunity to position himself before a mirror, tweezers in hand, and a determination to pluck every single one to uproot the evil from its source. But nature had its own rules, and the results turned out to be quite contrary to his expectation. For every gray hair that he removed, four new ones poked out, glistening mockingly at him in the mirror. Not that he was in any mood to relent. The battle continued for months and ended only when he had lost some three quarters of his mustache <laughs> and left his upper look, lip looking like a scarred battlefield. <laughs> What a beautiful description. What a beautiful description. Uh, you know, that's the joy of translating uh, somebody like Nanak Singh. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, I had... I had a, was it this much, uh, this much funny in uh, original Punjabi? I'm sure it was. Okay. Uh, uh, but the tone was similar? The tone was similar, but that also, you know, you insert a bit of yourself into agreed, it, right? Agreed, agreed. Uh, uh, to, so, so, if it is... To me, the best compliment is 
if somebody says, oh, it doesn't read like translation, hmm. right? right. Uh, which means you probably succeeded in what you were trying to do. In uh, transcreating. In, in, in transcreating, yeah. Cool. Sounds interesting. Let, let's talk about uh, his legacy. Mm -hmm. He has written n number of literature, n number of poems. What do we, uh, what does the youth or what does the so-called Gen Zs in this, uh, in this current environment learn from it? Uh, certainly calling a spade a spade is something which everybody should uh, focus on. But what, what all other traits sure. of his personality do you see? So I think, you know, as a writer, he was way ahead of his time. Yes. Um, and the important thing to know about him, he had no formal education. You know, in a couple of his interviews, people asked him, Nanak Siji, what's your educational background? And he'd smile. He said, well, I don't know whether I should say chauthi pass or panchmi fail. Because, uh, you know, when he was eight or nine, his father was in Peshawar running a small kiryana dukan. Okay. And struggling. And so he asked this nine-year-old to come and be a helper in the shop. Um, and a year later, his father passed away. So my grandfather became an orphan at the age of 10 and the oldest son with the responsibility to look after the family. So he had no formal education. And there's a message in that for the Gen Z that, you know, you can overcome odds by dint of your own hard work and commitment. Uh, when we were setting up this Nanak Singh Center in the university library, um, we started collecting all the work that had been done on his books. Okay. As stunned to see that there are some 63 or 64 dissertations, masters and PhD wow. on Nanak Singh for a person who himself had no formal uh, education. education. But the other thing I think in terms of his legacy is the way he took up issues that were so topical. So there are books of his which take up religious bigotry and he doesn't mind taking a, 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 a priest from a Gurdwara and making him the villain uh, and, and exposing to us how this man uses expressions from the Guru Granth Sahib to justify evil deeds, right? And, and you plant that somewhere else, you can, you see people doing the same from the Quran and the Bible and the Upanishads, True. right? Or the Vedas. Yeah. Um, it's all of, about context and taken out of context. So he forces you to accept that, you know, beware that somebody is quoting something out of context to justify his ill deeds. And we see that this is happening all the time. All the time. He takes up caste. And, and several of his books are devoted to the oppression of the lower castes and, and how society has been so unjust. He was probably the first writer in Punjabi to take up the cause of women. And, and, and I'll just, you know, so in many of his books, he has really strong women characters. And curiously, my mother who was, a, as I said, a professor of Punjabi language, um, her master's dissertation was on the female characters of Nanak Singh's novels. Wow. Um, and, 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 and in his own uh, autobiography, which was one of the first autobiographies in Punjabi literature in 1949, he says something really profound. He said, I've always tried to be, bring up the plight of women in our society mm -hmm. uh, through my books. But I think I've made a mistake somewhere because in my first half a dozen novels of which Pavitra Papi was mm -hmm. one of them, he said, I allowed my character to become a victim of society and I often ended up killing the victim. The victim pays the price, <laughs> which is wrong. And so in my later books, I wanted my women to be feisty, to be fighting the oppression not just be victims to the oppression. Uh, and, and so in my later books, you find women who are bucking the society and, 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 and no, super women, uh, women. fighting for their own place in, in it and not just be docile victims. Uh, so, you know, you could see where his mind was in, in, in trying to bring. He certainly uh, um, got 
uh, a, a very egalitarian mindset and he um, again kind of finds ways to make us empathize with those who are poorly off simply because they are poor not because they lack intelligence not because they lack True. integrity or character yeah. but they were born poor and they never got the opportunity to get out of it so i think you know for when you said message for gen z i think reading his books makes you aware through his characters of issues that are deep in our society and which are still there yeah. and they're not just again they're not unique to our society. You, you, you see them all over the place. But I think, uh, you know, for him to bring them up the way he did. And I think the reason why it's important. I think human beings are conditioned to respond to stories. So what might be a dry anodyne four page chapter on the partition, your school textbook. Mm -hmm may not perhaps register on you, yeah. but a story told through characters that you can empathize with, relate to, will probably stick in your mind for much longer. And I think that's the beauty of uh, the art of storytelling, picking real issues that he did. Excellent. So my next question, uh, probably the penultimate one, is basically more of a philosophical question. When we say, when you say that he never had a formal education. He's from a very small cow. Itna exposure bhi nahi hai ki kya sahi hai, kya galat hai. You don't know what is right, what is wrong. You have no clue. He's a 10 year, 11 year old kid. He certainly does not know the real world problems which are actually around him. How do you develop that mindset? How do you become so sane? How do you become uh, so... You know, he, so he describes his journey in his autobiography, Mary Dunya, and he's quite open in acknowledging that when he was 14 or 15, mm. the shop was running, his younger brother was more capable at running it. Okay. He had developed a penchant for music and poetry. Okay. Fairly early on. And he became very popular with his well-to-do friends, and they would say, sing us a song. Okay. I forgot to mention, so he, he at that point, his name was still Hansraj. He was born Not into Hans. a Hindu family. And he's kind of lost, wayward, looking for a purpose. And there's this Gurdwara in Peshawar, uh, where he comes under the uh, influence of a very erudite, very pious uh, uh, Granthi, okay. a gentleman called Gyani Bhag Singh. Okay. And Gani Bhag Singh observes him and sees, he says, you've got talent, why are you messing around? Come join our Kirtan Jatha. Oh. Okay, and put your musical talent to better use. And he joins that and he starts enjoying it. And he becomes close to Gani Bhag Singh and uh, soon enough converts to Sikhism and takes the name of Nanak Singh okay. from, from, from Hans Raj. But he also observes Gani Bhag Singh uh, as uh, an altruistic uh, activist trying to do something for society. And I think his moment of reckoning is 1917 when the Spanish flu brought by soldiers coming back from the First World War right. hits the region okay. and people are dying everywhere. And Yani Bhag Singh puts his Kirtan Jatha and his uh, young army of volunteers to the job of trying to rescue, trying to give medicines, uh, you know, take dead bodies to the uh, for burial or for uh, cremation or whatever. And all of this in those formative years has a profound influence on uh, a 17, 18 year old. And later on, in, and he writes, that's why in many of his books, Gyani Bhag Singh appears in some form or another, like in this one, the Hindu elder Baba Panesha, uh, the erudite gentleman who is the head of the village, um, is loosely tailored on Gyani Bhag Singh. In another book that I translated, A, Li a Life Incomplete, there's a guy called Varyam <coughs> Singh who's similarly tailored. So he, he, he finds a way to make his mentor appear 
uh, in, in, in his books as this idealist, uh, what you should be, be. As, as a person. Yeah. Wow, so cool. Now, the ultimate question, we would love to have a read. Uh, we were discussing how, uh, what kind of uh, anecdotes he shared about his life, what kind of parallels he draw from the real life. Would you mind reading something? So let me, as we conclude the conversation, yeah. I think one point that he makes mm -hmm. uh, very uh, strongly uh, and very controversially mm -hmm. um, is independence was the flip side of partition. Right. And he says, anybody who knew me, even not so well, knew that every pore of my body strived for India's independence. You know, uh, and he went to jail in 1922, spent nine months in Lahore, watched the jail and so on. And yet, and he writes this on the 13th of August in this book, as we are approaching 15th of August, the day when we are finally going to be rid of 200 years of British rule, I have to pause and think, is, was it worth it to lose our humanity? Because that's what I've seen, that we've lost our insaniyat. And he says, isn't it ironic, everywhere around us from Madras province to UP to Delhi, we are seeing the celebrations being planned, grand celebration for India's independence, the tricolor will be unfurled and buildings will be lit up and people who've been incarcerated in prisons are going to be released. And he brings us to what's happening in Punjab. And that's the passage that I will read to conclude. This is on 272, right? Yeah. Our head spins in wonder as we step back and look at the enthusiasm and energy with which these celebrations are being planned. Martial law is to be imposed in 11 districts of Punjab and other arrangements are being put in place to make sure that nothing unpleasant happens when the limbs of Mother India are being hacked. Leading members of our communities, meanwhile, are sharpening the spears of Hindu Mahasabha and direct action uh, because they feel that the Congress High Command has been unjust to them, that they have received a smaller piece of Mother India's body than they expected. The Sikhs are convulsing with their own anger over the division, complaining that the large and fleshy thigh from the leg that was Punjab has gone to Pakistan, while they were left just with a spindly calf. The Muslim League, to be sure, had some reason to rejoice over the part that they had received, but they viewed the celebrations with the jaundiced look of one who is observing a wedding at his enemy's home. How did the jubilant songs of independence sound to those whose ears were still ringing with the haunting cries of thousands of innocent victims, whose eardrums had become accustomed to the loud reports of gunshots and the deafening boom of exploding bombs? For them, the joyful tunes were like hymns in blood. The celebrations were like a game of fire. And those are the two titles of these books. I have read a lot of lot of translations, but I guess uh, this was indeed a very emotional one. It was indeed a very soul touching one. And thank you for doing this because I guess a legacy should always should always be passed on to the next generation and I guess this is the perfect way to do it. Uh, there are very few people who are writing books these days, there are very few people who are, not few I wouldn't say, but the readers' numbers have certainly declined over the years, but I really want this to be transformed and more and more people should read and I guess this will be a perfect example for… You know, um, I mean, I'll tell your young listeners to find a way to distinguish between information and knowledge. knowledge. There's overdose of information before us and you can get all the information you want through WhatsApp and through other uh, media. Knowledge comes from books. True. Read. Read as much as you can. That makes sense. Thank you very much, Ambassador Suri, for having this conversation with me. It was lovely to host you on this podcast. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.